What's up everybody, this is a presentation I did about Milky Way photography for some camera clubs and not everybody can make it out to see that presentation in person so I decided to make this video and upload it that way you could check it out if you were unable to attend and uh, or if you just wanted to learn some more about the basics of Milky Way photography. So without further ado, here we go. Whether you're already taking pictures of the night sky or just admire others that do, I think there's a reason why we're so fascinated with the stars. The pictures of the night sky remind us that we're basically on a spaceship spiraling through the galaxy. It just so happens that our spaceship is massive and has an ecosystem to support life, which is amazing. And I think we forget that, especially growing up in New Jersey, where we live these fast-paced lives next to large cities that block out the stars with light pollution. Astrophotography has helped many people, including myself, slow down this busy world and reconnect with the stars like our ancestors before us. So what is nightscape photography? Nightscape photography is a representation of a night scene captured with your DSLR camera. With advancements of DSLR technology over the past decade or so, it's become easier than ever to photograph a nightscape with most of today's cameras. Typically the goal of a nightscape is to capture a landscape feature with a starry night sky. That foreground feature can be lit naturally or artificially, which I'll get into further as this presentation continues. On this next slide, I want to show you what your naked eye can see versus what your camera could pick up. This is Bonsai Rock at Lake Tahoe. Many people ask, can you really see the Milky Way with your naked eye? And the answer is yes, if you go to a dark enough place, it would look similar to the image on the left. The camera exposure can gather in more light than your eyes, so we're able to capture more detail, which is what you see here in the middle. And then if we add some contrast or saturation to the edit, we can enhance the features of the Milky Way to really make it pop. As you can see here, a large percentage of people have never seen the Milky Way with their naked eye before, and that's because of light pollution. Unfortunately, in the east, we have to travel to pockets of dark areas up north or along the shoreline to capture images of the Milky Way galaxy. These varying colors are different Bortle classes, which I'll explain in the next slide. The Bortle scale is a nine-level numeric scale that measures the night sky's brightness of a particular location. It quantifies the astronomical observability of celestial objects and the interference caused by light pollution. Ideally, you want to find a location that's a Bortle class 1, 2, 3, or even 4 for the best results of photograph in the night sky. So next I want to talk about how I escaped the light pollution in New Jersey. Because as you see, it's quite challenging when searching for the Milky Way galaxy. New Jersey's southern shores like Cape May, Avalon, Point Pleasant Beach, and Island Beach State Park are some of the best locations. When the Milky Way rises southeast over the ocean, you might be in a Bortle 5, but you're shooting towards a Bortle 4 and 3, so it makes it possible to get a decent Milky Way photo. If you want an even better photo of the Milky Way, I suggest driving 3.5 hours down to Assateague Island in Maryland. There you'll be in a Bortle 3 shooting into a Bortle 2. You could also take the 5 hour drive up to Cherry Springs State Park, which is one of the darkest places in the east. Regardless, the reality is, we have to travel relatively far distances to hunt the Milky Way due to our location. So for the next few slides, we're going to discuss the Milky Way season and apps that will help you find the Milky Way. And I also recommend getting a compass since chasing the Milky Way sometimes brings you to areas that have little to no cell service. For example, if you know the Milky Way is rising in the south, then you can verify that you're looking in the right direction with your compass instead of relying on a phone, which tends to be inaccurate. The best times to observe the bright galactic center of the Milky Way in most parts of the world tends to be from about mid-March through mid-November. That's what many photographers have dubbed the Milky Way season. Technically, you can see some part of the Milky Way at any time of the year, but should be limited to less parts of the Milky Way. Most photographers chase after the nuclear bulge of the Milky Way, which is comprised of stardust and tightly packed groups of stars. As you can see from these four images that are all a month apart, the Milky Way is in drastically different positions. Typically it starts in the east and then drifts towards the south, however in late summer months it will be more south drifting towards the west. This is why it's important to plan your shots accordingly. There are many phone apps to help you locate the Milky Way and some for your desktop as well. My favorite one for the desktop is Stellarium which is free for your computer. With this software you just type in your location and then you can scroll through the date and time you want to go out shooting. It will show you where everything is like satellites, the sun, moon, planets, constellations, and so on. When I determine the direction of the galactic center of the Milky Way is rising, east, south, or west, I'll take note and then I'll bring my compass as well. Another great app I start using and highly recommend is PhotoPills. This app costs around $10, but 
but it contains everything you need and more to plan your shots. You could drop a pin on the location you plan to photograph and scrub through the times to see exactly where the moon, the sun, and the Milky Way will rise and set. These white dots represent the Milky Way with the large dots showing where the galactic center of the Milky Way is. So this really is a great tool to have and it contains many other features as well, so definitely check this out. When planning, you need to take an account for twilight, which could take about an hour and a half before night truly begins. The hour and a half transition period may be shorter or longer depending where you're located. In this photo of Mono Lake, I took some shots during astronomical twilight. To the naked eye, everything started to appear very dark. However, my camera was still picking up a lot of light from the sun since it did not reach 18 degrees below the horizon yet. You could even see the Milky Way core starting to show on the left very faintly. You could use nautical and astronomical twilight to your advantage to create some cleaner night images. Some people like to take an image at twilight, then wait for true night and take another exposure with the Milky Way out and in its position. Then they blend those photos together in post-processing, creating a much cleaner image. You also need to be aware of the moon now could impact your image. Always ask yourself these three questions. When will it rise or set? What phase is it in? And how can it affect my image? because the moon can help or hurt your photo. You could use it to light up the foreground like this image below, but if the moon phase is too bright, then the Milky Way would be diminished drastically. So typically night photographers shoot during new moons when the sky is the darkest. Next, I want to talk about the tools that I use to reconnect with the stars. A camera capable of long exposures. A solid tripod is the most important piece of equipment along with your camera. You're dealing with long exposures, so you need a sturdy tripod to prevent any type of camera shake. Next, I recommend a fast lens like a 1.4, 1.8, or a 2.8. We want to get as much light into the camera as possible. Originally, I was going to say a fast wide-angle lens. However, some of my favorite Milky Way photos were taken with a 50mm prime. Nowadays, it's very easy to stitch a panorama, so a 50 or 85mm prime will work great for the Milky Way. I do primarily shoot nightscapes with my Nikon 14-24 2.8 wide-angle lens, and sometimes with my fisheye lens as well. Now don't be discouraged if you don't have an expensive fast wide angle lens. As long as you have a relatively new DSLR, high ISO can be pushed pretty far to compensate for the lack of light from a slower lens. And I also have some techniques that's going to help with the noise reduction, which I'll discuss later. Other tools I recommend are intervalometers or a remote trigger, which are great tools but they're not necessary unless you start getting into more complicated shots. Sometimes you may press a shutter button and cause a little bit of camera shake, so getting a trigger of some sort will prevent that. You could also use your timer mode on your camera as well. Now with my Nikon camera, it has a built-in intervalometer, which is very useful for night photographers, especially time lapses. And a lot of my night photography techniques require exposures longer than 30 seconds, so a remote trigger has become essential to me. The last thing I recommend is a headlamp with a red light. The red light will help you see in the dark, but not diminish your view of the night sky after your eyes have had a chance to adjust to the darkness. Photographing at night is more than just taking a long exposure. You really need to plan your shots out in advance and make them interesting for your audience. Nowadays, anybody with a digital camera and a tripod can photograph the Milky Way. However, not everybody could take a compelling image. Before going out at night, I highly recommend you do your research about the area you plan on photographing. I like to use Google Maps and some of the Milky Way apps that I discussed earlier to plan these shots. I also recommend going to the spot first during the day and familiarize yourself with that location so you'll be more at ease come nightfall. I find myself going alone to many of these places at night, so you want to be aware of any dangers that might be in the area, like snakes in the dunes, uh, when is high tide, heat advisories, wild animals, how well is the trail maintained, things of that nature. When it comes to focusing at night, a lot of times we're focusing at infinity in manual focus mode. As many of us know, the infinity mark on your lens is usually inaccurate. What I like to do with my lens before going out at night is to take them out during the day and focus on an object far away to help me find infinity. Some lenses I can make a mark with a sharpie marker and other lenses I can't do that like my Nikon 14 to 24. So I take a reference photo with my phone and I use that to kind of help me get started at night. Some people find infinity during the day and then they tape the focus ring down so it's already set up for nightfall. Another good way to find focus at night is to use your LCD screen and zoom in on a bright star at 100%. Then manually focus your star until it's nice and round, and take some test shots until it's perfect. If the moon is still out, you can use that as a light source as well. Another option is to set a light source like your headlamp on the ground, and then use that to focus on. 
Typically, if we're shooting with an ultra wide angle lens, you only need to walk about 15 to 30 feet away for that lens to be set to infinity when you're focused on your headlamp. So let's jump over to some of my most common settings that I use. The most common settings I start off with when shooting the Milky Way with an ultra wide angle lens is f2.8, ISO 3200 to 8000, shutter 13 to 25 seconds. These settings will change depending on the light pollution in the area, whether or not I want more ambient light on the foreground, and how bad are the stars trailing. With this sample photo, you can see at 25 seconds, the stars are starting to become more egg-shaped and less circular when we zoom in at 100%. For many people, this is acceptable and one of the challenges when it comes to photographing the night sky. The rule of 600 was devised to help us pick shutter times that would be acceptable in mountain star blur. I'm going to spare you some of the mathematical talk about the degrees of the earth rotating and the number of pixels of degree of movement mumbo jumbo and the short answer is just divide your focal length from 600. So for example let's use a 24 millimeter lens. If we do 600 divided by 24 we get 25 which is the recommended exposure time in seconds. If we use a 400 millimeter lens and follow that equation we end up with 1.5 second exposure time. The longer the lens, the shorter we could leave the shutter open to avoid motion blur. The rule 600 was figured out using a full frame 24 megapixel camera. However, we now have a 36, 42, and 50 plus megapixel cameras. The rule 600 does not quite cut it for pixel peepers like myself that have higher megapixel cameras. Some people have adopted the rule 500 or even 400 for sharper stars. The rules will help you get pointed in the right direction, but ultimately it'll be a trade off for acceptable star blur and acceptable ISO noise. This was the crossroad I was stuck at for several years until recently adopting different methods which I'll explain in the next slide. With two exposure blending, we take an exposure of the Milky Way and a really long exposure of the foreground at a lower ISO to get a clean image that we blend together. So for example with this image, I composed a lighthouse and took a minute long exposure at a lower ISO to give me a cleaner image of it, but it had star trails. So I took a second exposure right after with a shutter of 20 seconds and a higher ISO which gave me sharper stars. I then made sure the images were aligned in Photoshop with the sky layer on top. I created a mess which revealed the cleaner lighthouse photo beneath. I really like this technique however I still get a noisy sky with a little bit of star blur. It's not terrible but I always strive to improve which brings me to my next method. Star trackers counteract the rotation of the earth allowing you to take longer exposures with your DSLR to obtain sharper stars and draw in more light. These devices were originally used for telescopes, but have since become smaller and more portable, allowing night photographers to take them virtually anywhere. There are several different brands and sizes of trackers which are pretty closely priced. Some can handle more camera weight than others, and some are more compact and better for traveling, so it boils down to personal needs. Here's an example of how I create night images using a star tracker. Typically, I take a long exposure of the foreground first. This is a six minute exposure of Palouse Falls in Washington State with a little bit of light painting on the falls to make it stand out even more. The six minute exposure caused the stars to trail, but it also allowed the camera to use starlight to illuminate the ravine. Shorter exposures were giving me pitch black results of the ravine, which I didn't like. I wanted as much detail as possible. Once I was satisfied with the foreground, I decided to put my tracker on my tripod and take some long exposures of the sky. This is a single exposure of the sky using a tracker, and you can see the foreground is blurry due to the tracker's rotation. But my stars are sharp, and I was able to capture so much more light from the sky. Here you can see the green air glow, which is a faint emission of light in the atmosphere, and on the right I captured an iridium flare, which is a type of satellite flare made by the antennas of a satellite reflecting the sunlight. Now once I have my two images, I have to combine them together in Photoshop or a similar program. Here's the finished product of blending my foreground with the track sky. This technique is an extremely clean and sharp results. The one mistake I see often when creating blended images like this is the lack of light fall off. So what I mean is as elements in your foreground get further away, they should technically get darker. A common editing mistake I see over and over again is exposed foregrounds that look like it's almost daylight blended with the Milky Way. We know that's not how it looks naturally so it comes off looking extremely fake. You want to find that happy medium for your illuminated foreground that still looks like it's nighttime. Here's another example of a blended track sky and a lit foreground of Silex Spring at Yellowstone National Park. I blew up a section of the stars to show how sharp they are. 
Another technique I like to use for sharper and cleaner images is stacking software. Starry Landscape Stacker is a $40 stacking program for Apple computers, and Sequitor is a free stacking program for PCs. Now I've done tutorials for both programs and they're relatively easy to use. The way these stacking programs work is you take consecutive photos of the Milky Way in your foreground and the programs average the images together. When you combine bits of information from each photo, you're essentially increasing dynamic range and reducing noise. What's so great about these two programs is they separate the foreground from the sky for you, so you don't need to be a Photoshop wizard. Then the programs stack the separated sky and foreground to reduce noise and they put it back together and this creates one clean image for you. Here's an example of a single image versus five photos stacked at Joshua Tree National Park. These software programs are fantastic for people that can't spend several hundred dollars on a tracker and don't want to lug around extra weight. Also, if you're not Photoshop savvy, then this program is a great alternative since it blends everything together for you. I have tutorials on both programs on my YouTube channel for those that are interested. Let's jump over to lighting your foreground. Using lighting is a great way to accentuate a foreground element. And typically the lighting you use doesn't have to be that powerful. A lot of times I find myself trying to diffuse or bounce my low level lighting because it's too harsh. LED lights have become smaller and more powerful. I use a light similar to what you see here to light up a school rock formation in my foreground. Even on my lowest setting, the light was so bright I had to shine it down towards the ground so the illumination on the rocks would be more subtle. Now I could have moved the light further back, however I want to concentrate it on a particular area. My LED light did not have the barn doors like the one that's pictured here, so it was harder for me to control the spread of the light. However, once I was satisfied with the results, I just photoshopped out the harsh spot right here. Now the beauty of these lights is how small and versatile they are. Because of the size of them, I typically bring two along with me for more dynamic lighting situations like you see here. This is Elephant Rock at Valley of Fire State Park, Nevada. I set up one light on the right to help illuminate the rock, and another under the trunk of the Elephant Rock as an accent light. The great thing about these LED lights is that they're constant lighting, so you can do a time lapse while your foreground is lit up. If you don't have an LED light, you can use a simple flashlight or a headlamp to light up your scene. It's always good to bring a spare white t-shirt with you to use it to wrap around your light as a diffuser. One of my favorite things to do is a self-portrait of me holding a light sphere. The light sphere diffuses the light nicely and it's also great for illuminating elements in your foreground, but it's not good for time lapses since it's not a constant light. Let's talk about Milky Way panoramas. To help make stitching your Milky Way panoramas go as smoothly as possible, try using these tips. Make sure your tripod and camera are both level. I recommend getting a nodal slider which allows you to pivot from the lens and not the camera's body. When you rotate from the camera body, you run the risk of parallax, which can result in the panorama not stitching together correctly and can also create exaggerated curved lines, almost like a fisheye effect. When using my 14mm lens, I put it in portrait orientation mode and I pivot the lens in 15 degree increments to give me plenty of overlap for my panoramas. Milky Way panoramas are easy to achieve when the Milky Way is closer to the horizon early in the season. At this time you can achieve a panorama with a single row of images. As the Milky Way gets higher in the sky, you might have to do a more complex double row of images and stitching starts to get a little bit trickier at this point. Here's examples of other fun things you could do at night like star trail photography, spinning wool, and light painting. Now many people are afraid of the dark, but once you learn how much fun it could be, you really have nothing to fear. In the past five years, I've been trying to master the lights of the night sky. The picture on my left is my first Milky Way photo ever taken in September of 2012, and the one on my right was taken in September of 2016 in Colorado. It's quite a difference. My white balance is off, the image is out of focus, and my post-processing was terrible. I want to show you that even I didn't start off taking amazing Milky Way photos. Like anything else, it took time and practice. Hopefully with this presentation, you could take away the tools and knowledge that will help you grow with your night photography faster than you ever could have imagined. Let the love for your stars overcome your fear for the night. Thanks for listening.